<coughs> I was introduced here. <laughs> okay. Welcome, everyone, to our monthly invited uh, talk that we organize uh, at our institute. Um, it's a pleasure to have uh, Thorsten Wemmer here, who recently accepted a professorship at University of Vienna. Uh, he used to be a professor at Simon Fraser University in uh, Canada, Vancouver, and he recently moved to Vienna uh, with his group. And uh, Thorsten is going to talk about visual tools uh, for understanding multidimensional parameter space. And yeah, uh, let's enjoy your talk. And uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mark and, and Oliver and everyone uh, for inviting me. It's a it's a great pleasure and an honor. Um, it was a, a lot of fun to actually see what you're doing here, um, and uh, uh, hopefully some things that we're doing is, is inter of, in of interest to you as well. Um, what I'm presenting here actually is is a work um, that has been to a large degree been done at Simon Fraser University because, as Mark said, I just joined uh, the University of Vienna um, uh, earlier this year. Um, but uh, nonetheless, the work that uh, I want to present um, uh, spans several different projects. Um, and uh, um, but in order to motivate what I'm trying to do is, I actually like to start with a little quiz. Um, and I'm showing you a quote from a paper, from a very famous research paper. Um, and uh, the quiz is, which paper is it? Um, so the quote is, each match must agree with 15 degrees orientation, square root of 2 change in scale, and 0 0.2 times maximum model size in terms of location. If fewer than three points remain after discarding outliers, then the match is rejected. What paper is that? I'll give you a hint, it has more than 25,000 citations. Uh, hint number two, it's in computer vision. Is it uh, from my AAA spectrum? Uh, no, it wasn't published in spectrum. Sift. Correct. Was that, what else can it be? <laughs> so this is work by, by David Lowe um, in 1999, Object Recognition from Local Scale and Varying Features. Stiff uh, has a tremendous amount of citations. It's used quite a bit. Um, and David Lowe, uh, who I don't know uh, which of you knows him. He's a he's a very impressive guy, and he he really tinkers with stuff until it actually works. And one of the beautiful things of this this work is uh, there's tons and tons of parameters. If they're set just right, it, it works beautifully. This method. Um, and uh, there's parts of the paper, and this is only one part, a small part of the paper, where he basically documents which parameters um, uh, he found to work best. <clears throat> the question is, how do you get there? Um, and this is sort of the, 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 how do you find those specific parameters? Um, and this is the core of my talk. Um, and I will not talk about SIFT in particular, um, but uh, I will actually start with a few case studies um, uh, where we have started to work with very specific application areas um, uh, and where we're helping, trying to help people uh, that have the problem of coming up with proper parameters and how do you do this. Um, in the first case uh, is Tuner, uh, which is a tool for image segmentation. Uh, the second case is Fluid Explorer uh, for fluid animation in uh, visual effects. Uh, the third one is a tool which we call Vismon, uh, which helps the fisheries managers to determine uh, sort of harvest rates uh, and determine fish stocks uh, in the Alaska Yukon area. Um, but those are very three extremely different application areas, and they seemingly have nothing in common. But what they have in common, actually, is uh, a simulation engine that's in the background um, that uh, does some kind of optimization where we're trying to figure out what are the right parameters to set them. And so after briefly talking about them, what I'm uh, actually after, and what's interesting from a computing science point of view and from a visualization point of view is what are the commonalities between those application areas, and what are also those differences, and what are the challenges in those aspects? And that's sort of the, the last part of the talk that I want to focus on. But let me start with something concrete. Let me make this, this problem that I'm uh, proposing here a little bit more concrete on the example of image segmentation. What is image segmentation? Well, we have some kind of 
uh, recorded image. Uh, in this case, it's a it's a PET image, positron uh, positron emission tomography image, uh, which typically does lots of noise. Um, but the challenge is is finding out which regions uh, of this brain image um, is the bone, which region is the putamen, which one is the gray matter, the white matter, et cetera, et cetera. And um, uh, so, how can we basically classify each pixel in a proper anatomical region? Um, and this type of problem goes back long, long time. It's not new. Uh, so one of the earliest uh, uh, algorithms were done by Mara Hildreth. Uh, uh, but an algorithm that's still pretty much in use today, oftentimes, is a canny edge detection algorithm, which actually works uh, with uh, a bunch of uh, a few different thresholds that you need to set such as a width of a Gaussian that you apply and uh, a low and a high thresholds that you're applying on there. And depending on, um, well, actually I have a, yeah. So depending on how you set some of these parameters, you get different types of edges here. Okay, so if you set it the sigma to one, you get one type of image. If you say, set it to two, you get a different type of edges and you'll see that it's approximately the same in some places, like in these places, but in other places here it changes quite a bit. So what's the right one? And what's the, the one threshold that works for all images um, would be an interesting question. Um, now, in modern image segmentation, uh, the approach is something along the lines that um, we're, we're building an energy function um, where each energy expresses a, a particular um, uh, optimal criteria that we'd like. Um, uh, so for instance, one energy could be the smoothness of the edges we're, we're creating. Another energy could be some sort of thickness of the edges. A third energy could be expressing uh, the overlap with a particular prior that we have, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And we have multiple different energies that we're basically combining through a bunch of different weights, alpha, into uh, one single energy that now uh, we want to optimize. And now, because we have a single scalar energy, there's lots of uh, interesting mathematical algorithms that find an optimal, uh, a maximum or minimum, depends on whether we want to maximize or minimize the energy function. So this is the, the basic setup, uh, and just E expresses the energy. I is the input image that is going into the algorithm. Phi is the actual, actual segmentation that's coming out. And the difficult part is, how do we set those weights? Um, and uh, the answer, the traditional answer, is uh, a, fairly, a fairly tedious loop. Um, and the loop goes like this. Uh, we kind of guess a parameter combination. It might be an educated guess. It may be a random guess. Um, we actually compute the segmentation. And depends on your programming skills, depends on the package that you're using in C++ or MATLAB or R or whatever it is. Um, that could take a while. Um, in fact, with some of the uh, segmentations code, codes that we were working with with our collaborators, some of them were taking 10 to 15 minutes for one segmentation to come up for some uh, 3D microscopy data. Um, and then once the segmentation is there, you actually evaluate the segmentation. Oftentimes, you visually look at it. Sometimes there's also some sort of um, uh, objective measures, like a dice metric or an error metric or a bunch of different metrics that you can apply to sort of evaluate numerically the quality of your segmentation. Perhaps you can compute it with a, with a um, uh, ground truth um, uh, that you're testing your algorithm with. And then you'll find out that, well, it kind of sort of works, but not really. And what if we change that one parameter a little bit over? And then you re-enter this loop from here. You, you don't completely guess a new parameter combination. You change your parameter combination again. Uh, you wait for your segmentation resolve. Um, once it comes out, you evaluate it visually through error measures, et cetera. And then you have another idea uh, the, other, uh, the other parameter, if I change that, maybe then it will get better, et cetera, et cetera. And oftentimes, this loop, uh, simple uh, as it seems, it's very time consuming. Um, in fact, uh, some, some of the folks that we have talked to uh, said they, they take weeks, if not months, to actually come up with uh, real good and, and interesting and proper parameters. So this is quite uh, a time, time consuming phase. 
Uh, some people say, well, that's what uh, that's why we have undergrad students or master students, and uh, they get their feet wet that way. But um, really, what we want is we want to speed up this part uh, of the parameter tuning aspect. So how can we uh, approach it in a little bit more systematic fashion? That's where parameter tuning comes in. Um, so the principal ideas that we have for for the tool that we created, Tuner, is that um, we have a ground truth available, so there's something comparable with. Uh, that's not always the case in practical applications, but if you actually uh, develop new algorithm, and that was the focus of our research in this particular uh, area, um, then people oftentimes actually do work with ground truths. So this is not a uh, unreasonable assumption. Um, and we use a bunch of quality measures. That means we're not necessarily uh, relying on a visual uh, evaluation of the result, uh, but we have a bunch of uh, different numeric measures. Some of them I already mentioned, something like a dice coefficient. If you don't know what it is, it's not really that important for the purposes of this talk. Or precision recall curves or other aspects that uh, numerically evaluate the quality of your segmentation. Um, and the requirements, actually, on the tool that we're creating is you want to have some sort of assurance that no, stor no, storm, no stone is unturned, meaning that you really uh, look at every place in the parameter space, that, you, uh, that you're not missing uh, the optimal parameter combination, for instance. And um, what you want is, very quickly, you want to find the good parameter combinations and separate them from the not so good ones. Um, and you want to evaluate also oftentimes how stable the parameter combinations is or whether there's some very sensitive parameters. That means um, if you were to use the same parameter combinations on a different image or in a different setting, would you expect a totally different output or would it be rather stable? Um, so how do we do this? Uh, in some ways, the idea, the basic idea is fairly simple. Um, and I only demonstrate that to you uh, visually here in a schematic in 2D. That means we have two different parameters that we want to tune. But the actual uh, implementation, as I'll show you later, is not constrained to just two parameters, um, at least not for tuner. So um, what we actually have in terms of parameter space, we have a multidimensional space. As I mentioned here, it's uh, basically just shown in 2D. And in this um, parameter space, we actually want to try as many as possible, or as much as we have time, parameter combinations. That means actually what we're doing, we're sampling this multidimensional, or in this case, two-dimensional space. Um, once we have sampled that space, um, we can sort of, in a batch processing overnight, while the user is not sitting in front of the computer and waiting for something, or over a weekend, or on a cluster, we can uh, basically compute all these different segmentations by putting it into the black box, uh, the MATLAB program, the R program, whatever it is, uh, and compute all of these segmentations at exactly those points of the parameter space. And so what we have is actually tons and tons of different segmentations collected here. Um, and now we need to make sense of it. And um, the sense that uh, we're making out of them is through the ground truth that we have available. We compare each of these uh, segmentations to the ground truth and derive some singular scalar measures of their quality. And oftentimes, we don't have just one. We have multiple of them, multiple competing ones. We can, uh, and oftentimes, if you sort of find the optimum of this measure, the optimum segmentation that uh, satisfies this measure, say a dice measure, um, it will not uh, optimize the second or the third or the fourth. So it's a question of uh, how do we deal with these competing evaluations of the segmentation in this particular case. Okay? But in principle, what we actually have is scalar function, a number of them. Uh, and each scalar function lives uh, on a domain of a high dimensional parameter space. And this is really uh, the input to our visual algorithm uh, that we're using. The big question now remains is how do we actually explore these high dimensional scalar functions? How do we make sense of them? Um, and the case study that I show you here, uh, as I already mentioned, is based on a dynamic PET study, PET positron emission tomography. It's a very, very noisy type of uh, image modality, uh, but that's quite common. Uh, the particular case that we're having, we're having 46 time steps. Uh, as I mentioned, it's very noisy. It tends to be uh, very challenging to actually segment these images properly. 
And the collaborators that were working with on this particular model, they were trying out uh, an energy model with eight competing and different energies that they all wanted to combine into an, uh, an optimization function. That means we actually have eight or, if you will, seven different weighting factors um, that uh, we just have to set right. The question is how. And the tool that we had developed to help them with this we call Tuner kind of looks like this. And it has different uh, components that I'd like to point out. Um, so um, perhaps I'm, I'm going to start with is uh, because there's eight parameters. Um, no, let, let me not start with that. There's two evaluation measures. Um, and um, these two evaluation measures are actually competing with each other. In this particular case, an error measure and a dice measure. These are measuring the quality of the resulting segmentations. Um, and uh, typically, <coughs> oops, uh, that was the wrong button. So typically, uh, the uh, the dice measure, um, uh, which one was which? Um, uh, I think this is the dice measure. The dice measure should be maximized. So here I'm curious in, in anything that's sort of in the upper parts of the measurement. And the error measure should be minimized. So here I want to be in those ranges. That means if I look at all possible sample points and all possible segmentations that I computed, um, the ideal ones, um, they should be located down here in this part of the plot. And um, this is called Pareto view uh, because I'm actually, well, that's just the standard name that comes from statistics and how we uh, look at uh, the uh, multi-objective optimization problems. Um, here we have uh, what we call the response view. And what we're seeing here actually is the two scalar functions. Both of them uh, are built on a domain of eight dimensions of eight different parameters. Uh, and they're shown here in a hyperslice view. And if you don't know what it is, give me one second. I'll explain it in, in just a little while. Um, uh, but focusing on this, um, uh, again, here are two different scalar functions. And here is a color map that allows me to uh, sort of uh, see the differences in the scalar values in both of these functions. And the question is now, um, what are actually all these slices mean? Um, but before I explain that to you in eight dimensions, I want to explain that to you in three dimensions. If I have a three-dimensional volume and I look at this, uh, perhaps the standard way of looking or thinking about this is a three-dimensional volumetric rendering of that view. However, um, uh, what doctors are actually quite used to is to instead look at a bunch of slices. They have a focus point and they do three different slices in that uh, three-dimensional volume uh, that they look at. Conceptualize it looks like this. If I have a three-dimensional volume and I have a focus point here in the center, perhaps I can have <coughs> uh, sorry, sorry, I can have an, a y z slice here. I can have an x z slice here, or I can have an x y slice here, and I can basically uh, put them into such a matrix where here is the x coordinate always here. Here is always the y coordinate. Here is always the z coordinate. And then here we have the x coordinate across this row, the y coordinate across this row, and the z coordinate across this row. And of course, um, in the center here, we have x, x, y, y, z, z. That's not very interesting. And otherwise, <coughs> we basically have here the x, y slice, the x, z slice, and here the y, z slice. Um, and here we have the same slices just uh, uh, rotated, basically, or transposed, um, if you will. And I can spin this idea further into any arbitrary dimensions. Uh, for ND, I need to have a focus point, and then I can choose uh, two axes, and I can put a slice that is parallel to those two axes and perpendicular, basically, to all the other axes. Um, <coughs> and that would create <coughs> what is known as this hyperslice view here. Okay, so we can take any uh, parameter, say alpha six here and alpha alpha three here, and here we get a slice through alpha three, alpha six, and that's a way of how we get a local view in this really high-dimensional, eight-dimensional function here that we can explore. 
Um, and uh, besides um, the scalar function one, <coughs> which is the dice metric, we also have this error metric, the objective function two. And basically, we want to, in both cases, um, optimize. Um, we want to find a point in eight-dimensional space that optimizes both cases. Um, for the dice, we want to maximize it, so we want to be in the dark regions. And for the error uh, version, we also we want to minimize it. That means we actually inverted the color scale here also, such that we're looking for dark areas. Okay, and uh, so we would typically start um, with the Pareto view, uh, which gives us a sort of an, an overview of all the segmentations we actually computed, um, and we perhaps. <coughs> Uh, start with points down here that, according to the Pareto view, should be optimal. Um, and we can basically click on any point in here, um, and this uh, local view of the eight-dimensional function would uh, right away zoom into this local view and shows us the neighborhood, the slice neighborhood, of each of these uh, computed points. And that would be a starting point, for instance, <coughs> uh, in an exploration. Um, in this particular case, the, the <clears throat> what we have done is, first of all, this, these, these dark crosses, the crosshairs, is the current focus point we're exploring. Um, what we have done here also is we actually compressed the, um, uh, the, the, um, the color scale such that um, <clears throat> we really focus in on only the good dice measures. Um, but we decompressed a little bit this one, so we're a little bit uh, lax about the error measures. Okay, so now what we can do here, we can see in this particular point, uh, we can take actually interactively this uh, crosshair and move it into a dark region to improve perhaps locally uh, the selection of uh, the, uh, the, um, the segmentation. Okay, so if we're moving this over, this, this uh, crosshair from here to here, of course, all, all of the other uh, views will actually change um, uh, because I'm actually changing now my focus point in my eight-dimensional function. So, um, but um, I can now look at perhaps different slices. <coughs> um, I can look at these slices and see, well, actually in terms of alpha 4 and alpha 5 and alpha 6 and sigma, um, it seems rather stable, it seems to be in a good regions, and maybe those are the parameters that I really particularly care about, and everything is fine and dandy. Um, and sort of after a little while of the local exploration, I might uh, be happy with a particular focus point, and now I could change actually some aspects of the simulation in the background. For instance, I can, uh, since I have a ground truth, I can add more noise to the ground truth and then wonder whether this uh, particular focus point that I have found here is still optimal uh, if I actually have added noise. And in this particular case, what happens, of course, the function itself, they change. Um, but I see here that I could still be uh, in a good region. Um, but uh, this, this, this part is not as stable anymore. Um, and, uh, uh, um, uh, but I still can adjust my uh, choice uh, of the segmentation parameters such that I'm in a stable and in a good region. Uh, and then what I can do uh, further, I can say, OK, fine. Uh, I found another interesting point. It seems to be stable even for, for less noise and for more noise. And what I can do now also is I can refine the actual sampling of the eight-dimensional function in this particular neighborhood and see if I'm actually running more uh, experiments, more segmentations whether uh, the approximations that I had to do here to fill in this eight-dimensional function are good enough. Um, and if I'm uh, actually increasing my original samples uh, from 50 samples to 150 samples, I see a refined behavior uh, of this particular eight-dimensional function with more details, and yet I can uh, refine more locally to find even a better uh, uh, parameter set. So this is essentially uh, the type of exploration that we have been proposing here um, and that we were using with our collaborators. And the good news is that um, uh, an exploration or a finding of decent parameter neighborhoods and parameter settings went down from several weeks to just a couple of hours, and we were quite happy with that. So that's uh, image segmentation uh, results. 
Um, a totally different uh, type of application um, is uh, fluid animation in visual effects, where we developed a tool which we call Fluid Explorer. And what's the setting here? Uh, for visual uh, effects, um, uh, uh, especially for fluid uh, motion, uh, for fluid animation, uh, there are uh, sophisticated algorithms that are based on Navier-Stokes equations uh, that solve uh, partial differential equations, Navier-Stokes equations. Um, uh, this has uh, been incorporated in standard animation tools for a long time, what do you have? Uh, 3D Studio Labs, whether you have Maya, whether you have Houdini, or whatever you have. Um, they're sophisticated tools that do this, but uh, each of them actually have a lot of different parameters to control to do it right. Um, here is a screenshot of Autodesk Maya 2010. Uh, anybody who has worked with Maya before? So a couple people, so this is not foreign to you. Um, so that's what it looks like, um, and then you know that the learning curve of Maya is also pretty high, but we didn't work with novices, we used with people who have used the tool for 10 years and more years, uh, so experts. Um, and still, um, there's tons of different parameters that you, can uh, that you can change to impact the look and the feel uh, of the actual explosion, the fire, the, the fluids, etc., that are being simulated here. And the question is, how do you set those parameters? So there are actually tens of <coughs> different parameters where the results are rather hard to predict. Um, and the loop that people are going through here, even if they have worked on this for 10 years uh, and have worked on many, many films, um, it's, a, it's a really time-consuming trial and error uh, procedure where uh, one or two parameters are changed and we're waiting for a few minutes to see a new simulation. Does it look okay? Well, sort of. It's better, but now what? I, what, am, what am I doing? Uh, what's happening if I change another set of parameters? How's that working? And that oftentimes, uh, for them, they told us takes uh, about two or three uh, business days, which is about 50% of their time of actually developing this type of animation. Um, so, uh, how did we uh, um, help them, or how did we try to help them anyway? Um, uh, we developed Fluid Explorer, and the principal idea of Fluid Explorer is the following. Um, we actually start with Maya. The animator um, is, is typically uh, well versed to sort of get a coarse representation of the animation that they want. But what's really hard for them is to fine tuning because the parameters that they uh, change, they're not necessarily intuitive. And the effect of the fine-tuning of these parameters is not intuitive. Um, and it's not predictable of what really happens. But what they can do is they have a pretty good idea which four or five or six parameters are essential to uh, achieve the, the look and feel of the animation that they're after. And they also are able to pretty much give us the range that the parameters should be in. So this is really the input to our system. And what we're doing here is uh, uh, just for, uh, in the same way as Tuner, we're basically taking, in this particular case, this five-dimensional space that we have now, and we sample the hell out of it. So we're computing tons and tons and tons of animation. Now, that's very time-consuming, uh, but the beauty of it is it requires no interaction with the user. The user can go home, have a coffee, can have a conversation uh, with their coworker or work on another project, whatever they want to do. They don't need to be there. That can be done over the weekend. That could be done overnight. That could be done offline, with other words. Um, and then after all these sequences are computed, what we're doing, we're basically uh, clustering them. First of all, we take each sequence and we cut them into pieces. Um, and ideally, uh, or the purpose of the cutting off into pieces is that within one sequence, not much is changing. Basically, the behavior of the fluid, the explosion, whatever, is rather constant. Um, and then on top of it, what we're doing is we're also uh, creating clusters across sequences. So we're finding similarities between different sequences. Um, and uh, creative clustering. So this is uh, uh, <clears throat> happening in the background, and then uh, we present the results in a principled fashion, in an overview fashion, to the user um, with the idea that they can now interact with this particular tool in Maya to select the right sequence. Let's focus in on this tool just a little bit. So what do we see here? First of all, of course, we see the three-dimensional view of the fluid, and in fact, 
we can play it. Uh, so this is uh, this shows an animation. We can interact with it. We can rotate it around just as you're used to in Maya, basically. Uh, what you can do, um, but few, we have seen few people that actually do it, you can explore every single sequence one by one. They're basically listed here, uh, uh, one after the other. Um, and you have a standard interface of play, stop, fast forward, and stuff like that to interact with the animation. Uh, the novel view here, and the interesting view is the one down here. And what we have done here is the following. This is our clustered representation of all the simulation results. And uh, first of all, here is time. And what you have seen is what we basically did with time, we separated time into uh, equal units. Um, and for every unit, say we're taking this time interval, um, uh, we're now looking at all the sequences in this particular time interval, and we show all the clusters that are possible in this particular uh, short sequence of the animation. And in the beginning, you notice there's only one cluster, but then it spreads. And that's not too surprising, because the initial condition, the starting condition, in this particular case is always the same. So um, if you're just moving the animation just by a tiny little bit, not much has changed, no matter what the, hour, uh, no, no matter what the parameters are that you have set. Um, and then as you move this along, of course, because different sequences use different uh, parameters, the behavior of the animation changes drastically. And so as we're moving along in time, we're actually seeing more and more uh, uh, different behaviors, and therefore more and more clusters. And what the user now can do, they can basically say, at this time sequence, I'd like to have this type of behavior. And by the way, the icons that you see here are not static. As I'm rotating uh, this view, uh, all the icons also, also rotate uh, in response. So uh, I can also look at these uh, small icons also interactively, and I can see the animation, uh, the fluids, the explosions from different angles. So I can, at particular points, I basically constrain um, the set of all possible animation to only the ones that go through this particular cluster at this time, as well as the other cluster at another time. And so I can quickly constrain the, the type of behavior that I get and explore the number of sequences that way. OK. Um, I'm, I'm going to leave it at that. Um, by the way, I'm, I'm happy to show you videos for all of these. I'm happy to to discuss some of these more in detail, but I'd like to uh, show you one more uh, application, uh, which we call this one. And this particular application comes from fishery science. Again, totally, totally different application from image segmentation and uh, visual effects. Uh, totally different set of users that are using this. Um, uh, this time it's fishery science. But let me explain what's going on here. Um, as I was living on the uh, west coast of North America, um, uh, one of the biggest industries there is actually fisheries. And there's a lot of people that depend uh, on commercial fisheries. On, uh, uh, there's a bunch of people that depend on tourism there that includes fisheries, sports fisheries. Um, and there's also a bunch of people uh, that uh, um, <clears throat> depend on actually the fish, specifically the salmon, um, <clears throat> in the rivers to live off. And those are the, the native people, which we call the First Nations. Um, and so there's actually competing interests uh, every year of how much fish or how many fish are being harvested uh, out of the rivers there, uh, specifically salmon. So the case study that um, uh, have, we have been doing here uh, with our collaborators was uh, specifically salmon, um, a particular salmon uh, species. And we have worked with um, scientists um, in the Resource and Environmental Management Division uh, at SFU that have worked with fisheries managers for a long time. And what they have done is they took a lot of historical records of uh, salmon populations over the last uh, several decades. And they created predictive models um, uh, that were trying to predict if I'm setting, um, uh, for this particular year, 2013, the number of pink salmon that are allowed to escape uh, to spawn uh, to create new fish. Um, if I set that to 100,000, 
And then from the remaining fish, if I allow the commercial fisheries, the First Nations, the sports fisheries, etc., if I allow them to, to get 60% of the remaining fish uh, out of the ocean, out of the rivers, what would happen if I have the same kind of uh, condition set for the next 100 years? Will it be sustainable? Uh, will the fish population at one point break away and there's no fish left? Will there be an overabundance? What will happen? That's the big money question. Um, and uh, they created a predictive uh, uh, algorithm simulations, um, stochastic simulations, that were trying to predict this. And what they were trying to predict were actually two, uh, three different aspects. Uh, how many actual spawners will there be? It's nice to say 100,000 fish escape, uh, but there's not going to be a single person there counting all the fish and says 999,985, 999,000. That's not how it's happened. So there is some uncertainty. And so the question is, how many actual spawners are there? The other question is, of course, uh, for the First Nations, how much, how many salmon are there for me to live off this land? Whatever. The third question is, uh, the commercial fisheries, will it be viable? Can I employ ten folks and have five ships? Uh, can I pay for all of this? Will I make enough profit in the end that I can survive as, uh, as, a, as a, a small business owner or big business owner? Uh, those are the questions that have been raised. And the idea here is um, uh, that um, the two management objectives that were of concern in this particular study, as I already mentioned, was the number of fish that should escape that are allowed to spawn. And then after that, the remaining ones, what is my harvest rate? And by the way, my initial response was, well, if I have 100,000 that escape and spawn now, can't I just get 100%? And the answer is no. Uh, usually, what you want is something in 60, 70, 40 percent in that neighborhood, uh, because it's not an exact science. You didn't count exactly 100,000. There's all sorts of other aspects. There might be diseases. There might be this, that, and the other thing that also impact uh, the outcome after all. That's why it's not so clear that it really should be 100 percent. But it's been also simulated. What if? I just harvest everything that lives in the river, what happens then? So, um, and then what I do is for each of these, I basically, uh, again, sample uh, this, uh, in this case, relatively low dimensional space, truly two dimensional space. So for each of these uh, crosses, I actually run the simulation. And I record a bunch of information. I basically record a statistical summary of 100 years of what would happen if I set the management objectives to exactly this one and that one, to 60% and 200, no, 300,000 escapes. What will happen in the next 100 years if I actually do this? And I, I record from it the statistical summary. Uh, and uh, uh, what I actually record is the average and the median, and oftentimes they're compared in, in order to find whether I have a sort of a symmetric distribution or not. Um, I also uh, am curious about the coefficient of variation that's over those 100 years. Um, and the other thing is I, I typically record the, the percentage of years something bad has happened. What is bad? Uh, a, a bad year is if there's so few fish that I actually have to close commercial fisheries. Uh, I basically have no job. Uh, if I'm a commercial fisher, I have no job that summer. Um, I basically can go home and collect unemployment insurance. Um, or um, that uh, there's no fish left that I can actually get to feed my family. That's also a pretty bad year. So those are the, the events that are also being recorded. And um, so. Um, we co collect the statistical summary, and basically that means if we're recording for each of these points those four values, what we have is uh, four uh, of these two-dimensional plots. Um, but we don't have just four. We actually have uh, 12 of them because um, we do this uh, for the spawners, for the escapement. We do this for the commercial value of the fisheries, as well as for what is known as the subsistence catch. That means how much food is left for the First Nations. Um, so this is now a, a set of 12 different views of the same problem that you now want to actually optimize. Ideally, you want to find the optimal point in each of these 12 views. Um, and some of them you want to minimize the percentage of years uh, where something bad is happening. The coefficient of variation, you don't want much variation. Um, 
And some other things, like average and medium, so you actually want to maximize. You want to maximize the number of spawners you have. You want to maximize the profit you get, et cetera, et cetera. And so we translated that into a visual interface, which we call Bismon, um, which I also explained real quick what's happening here. Here are the 12 views. Uh, here are the spawners, the, the subsistence catch or the food. Here's the commercial catch. And here's the median, the average coefficient of variation and percentage of years something bad is happening. Here is this constraint pane. Um, and its purpose, I'm going to explain in a second. And over here is a detailed view uh, where I can compare different uh, choices of management options in a little bit numerical detail than I can do in the overview uh, view of those 12 plots. How do I use the system? I started a read uh, in the data and basically uh, show you such a, um, uh, a 2D plot that's colored. And dark color means good. Uh, light color means not so good. Um, and now I'm going to start my exploration and say, OK, um, the percentage of years the escapement, that the escapement is below target um, uh, should not be 100%. But I want to constrain it, say, say, every second year, if I don't have enough uh, spawners, uh, maybe that's OK. Um, so the, the environmental list of the table might push that even further down and further down. Um, and when I constrain it that way, I basically see all the management options that are not possible anymore, that are not uh, fulfilling this constraint or grayed out. And then the, um, the, um, uh, the First Nations representative on the table says, but and says, look, um, the number, uh, the percentage of years where I cannot live off the river should not be 100%. It should be much lower. Maybe every third year, maybe I can live with that. But that's about it. And likewise, um, and then you gray out further. Uh, likewise, the commercial fisheries people come online and says, you know, I need to run a business here. And if I have to close the business every year, that's it. You know, I'm not part of this anymore. But maybe 70%, uh, maybe I can live with this, and, and that will be fine. And so one by one, each of the, the different uh, uh, um, uh, parties uh, come to the table and can now negotiate what's tolerable for them. And at the same time, interactively, they see how much uh, maneuverability is left for the manager to actually make these constraints happen. And if the whole area is grayed out, then there's a problem. And people need to come together and find a compromise. And once they have found some sort of compromise, I can further explore these regions in detail. I can say, well, let me put uh, a sample right here. What if my management objective is 200,000 and 70%? Um, and I can collect basically these particular choices of management options in the detail view down here. And I can explore the space further and further uh, with different management, uh, particular management decisions. And then I can collect them here. And now there's different ways of more numerically than before comparing those decisions and pick the right ones, so to speak. OK, so those are the three applications, very, very different applications. Um, but they all have things in common. And what they have in common, I'd like to point out now. So the model uh, that, uh, that is behind all of them is that we have some kind of black box. And there's, there's smart people out there in many different domains that create this uh, black box. There could be uh, research in medical image segmentation that create a novel segmentation algorithm. Uh, there could be researchers in applied math that solve the Navier-Stokes equations in a novel way. Um, those could be uh, researchers in uh, resource environmental management that create simulations of how fish populations change over the years, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, then once that model is created of the real world, they're having questions about this model. And the, what they're doing is they're exploring this model by, by uh, plugging in different types of parameters that influence the outcome of what that model actually produces here. Um, and this is actually a half-truth uh, picture. And what's really happening here is not that we're getting an n-dimensional function out but then we're actually getting complex objects out. Those complex objects, objects could be segmentations, could be animations, could be all sorts of stuff, could be uh, um, uh, uh, time series of 100 years. 
And uh, oftentimes what I'd like to do, if possible, I'd like to reduce the complexity of these objects and summarize uh, uh, the essential parts of these objects through some objective measures or some features uh, that I do. And those are now truly uh, oftentimes uh, m numbers of some kind that I want to explore. So if I have such an environment, the inputs um, are oftentimes well chosen by the scientists. Uh, they have oftentimes reasoned about why five inputs and not four or six. Um, I have to admit there are uh, some people that are also not sure of how many inputs are necessary to model a particular phenomena, but I haven't worked with them yet, uh, and I'm curious about them. Um, normally, in our experience, they are continuous, but they don't have to be. Um, uh, and categorical type of uh, inputs can be uh, possible too. For instance, if I want to compare two or three different algorithms, one of the inputs is the, 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 the ID of the algorithm, for instance. The outputs themselves, as I already mentioned, are typically very complex, uh, 2D, 3D images, just like in tuner, animations, performance graphs. It could be social networks. One, one, of our, uh, one of my colleagues at Southern Fraser University had a simulator for how social networks actually develop. Um, uh, it could be simulations of robots. There's this open source framework that also a colleague of mine developed called Player Stage, uh, which basically um, uh, simulates uh, hundreds or thousands of robots. Uh, autonomous robots and how they would interact. And you can, of course, program those robots. And he was interesting in sort of how could uh, a large set of robots, how could they interact. Uh, so there's tons of stuff. And this is actually the core of what we know as computational science. Computational science is taking actual phenomena and creates computational models uh, and tries to explore the richness and the expressiveness of these models. That's in the essence uh, that's going on. So, but oftentimes it's hard to evaluate or compare many of these different outputs. Uh, and that's quite a challenge. Uh, in some of the um, uh, tools that I have shown, uh, our collaborators had some kind of either one dimensional or two dimensional uh, objective measures. The one dimensional ones turns, for instance, a segmentation uh, into a quality measure of a dice or an error. Um, Two-dimensional comparisons uh, measures might exist as well uh, that I compare output one and output two, that they're either similar or different. Uh, and maybe I can quantize that similarity factor as well. Um, the objective measures uh, ideally should be reliable. They should be exact. But in reality, they're usually not. The dice measure is not exact. It doesn't give you a, a proper idea of how good a quality of the segmentation is, but it gives you approximately an idea of what's going on. Um, same thing with the error measures that we use there. Um, so they can be about right, but not always 100% precise. And there's some cases, like in the Fluid Explorer work, where there's no objective measure actually possible, because the uh, director of the movie has a particular idea what the explosion looks like. And he or she describes it verbally to the person who actually simulates it and, and, and creates the, uh, the explosion. And the person that creates the explosion has another kind of idea of what the explosion should look like. But can they uh, formulate it uh, precisely into a measurable, numerically measurable way? No way. So um, here, uh, in these cases, we actually don't have these measurements possible. So uh, tasks that arise, though, um, uh, can also be a multitude of tasks. Um, on the one hand, we have optimization. <coughs> and uh, that's also where the term multi-objective optimization comes from. Um, many people would like to find the optimal uh, parameter set. But that's not the only uh, example. Uh, some people actually want to have a partitioning and the grouping. Um, but I'll explain that in a second. In the, uh, uh, a third one is sort of fitting is uh, you have a particular observation in the real world, and the question is, does your model actually express that? Is there a parameter setting that actually really does show you the behavior that you actually observed in the real world? And there is an aspect called steering uh, where I have very expensive simulations, and before they actually are finished, I might want to influence and change them through changing the parameter. Cross-cutting cross to all of these are aspects of sensitivity of the parameters and aspects of uncertainty of the actual computed result. 
But let me talk about them a uh, uh, little bit more detail, uh, one each. Um, so uh, optimization is the task of finding the best parameter combination given some objectives. That means the objectives need to be formulated in some way or shape or form. Um, in fact, if I only have one objective, uh, probably you, do, you don't need visualization. You, there's plenty of uh, beautiful mathematical algorithms um, that uh, can do an optimization even over a multidimensional space. Uh, but oftentimes, they have multiple objectives that need to be balanced. Uh, and the question is how to do that. And oftentimes, you need the user in the loop to, to figure out the balance, because the balance cannot be a priori determined exactly what it should be. 70% this and 30% that. If you can do that, great. You reduce it back to a, a scalar optimization algorithm. Oftentimes, you can't do that. Um, so if you have two or more, typically you do a Palmino analysis um, that's also integrated in Tutor. If you have multiple um, uh, competing objectives, um, you have to facilitate some kind of multi-objective trade-off as we were trying to do in a detail of you in this one. The partitioning task, what is this actually? So there are a number of people that are creating models not to find the best uh, expression, but what they're trying to do is they're trying to find out the expressiveness of a model. Case in point would be we worked with some mathematicians that actually have a, a, a PDE or actually more of an ODE that expresses swarming behaviors of animals. So there is no best swarming behavior, but they were questioning this with how few parameters can I get away to have a large set of swarming behaviors expressed. Uh, you know, like, um, uh, yeah, I, I should show you pictures, but I don't have them. Um, there are a lot of different swarming behaviors. Uh, I hope you believe that. <laughs> so the question is, can I express them all with my equation? Uh, and what are the parameters to do so? Um, so uh, what we're doing here is uh, we actually want to find some kind of partitioning of the output space. The outputs are actually the swarming behaviors. So I want to partition them, or segment them, or cluster them. And then once I cluster them, I want to apply that classification, that clustering, to the input space to figure out um, what types of parameters uh, set uh, uh, determine a particular swarming behavior. So maybe you'll find out that one parameter actually has no impact on the swarming behavior at all, uh, and things along those lines. <clears throat> So users want to know the parameter combinations and ranges that create one particular output behavior. Um, we had worked recently on, on uh, one such tool that uh, supports this, which we call Paraglide. Um, uh, the third task was fitting. And here the task was, as I already mentioned, where in the parameter space fall actual measured data. Uh, and in a way, that's sort of an inverse problem. Uh, it creates some kind of level set. Uh, if the terminology means anything to you. If not, don't worry. Um, so with other words, given only the outputs, uh, what inputs would yield this particular behavior? Um, so that could also be op uh, formulated as an optimization problem. And here, some colleagues of, of ours at uh, the VRBIS uh, have developed an interesting tool and have gone down this road a little bit called Hypermobile. Uh, the steering aspect, I have little experience thus far. I'd like to gain more. But here, the, the question is the user wants to actually change the parameter settings during the simulation run. Um, and um, some examples, for instance, that you might know is um, known as uh, simulation steering. And those are uh, kind of flight simulators, driving simulators, et cetera, where the simulation uh, engine is running and running and running, and you're sitting in front of it. Um, and you might uh, have uh, a steering wheel in your hand, and now you turn right. And at that moment, that's basically a parameter change that you do to the, the simulation. At that moment, the simulation needs to take it into account and change the outcome, the continuous outcome of the simulation over and over again. The other one that's often cited is computational steering, um, where I have, uh, for instance, people in climate modeling or using this, where they have simulations that run for a week on a supercomputer. Um, and instead of waiting for a week to actually look at the result, they might look at the result after a day, um, after two days, and maybe they see that there's a, there's a problem uh, uh, developing because the mesh size is not, is not fine enough. 
Um, and uh, there's some artifacts developing, and so they might decide at that point, well, let me change the mesh size now. Let's refine it. It might take a day longer, but you know that's OK. It, I'll get a better result. So that's the type of uh, aspect of uh, steering uh, that is possible. Sensitivity is uh, often a concern by uh, thinking about, about um, how stable are my optimal parameter settings. If I change the parameter just a slightly little bit, will I get a, to a totally, completely different output, or will it be the same? Um, in terms of partitioning, the question is, um, how quickly or slowly is the uh, simulation changing from one behavior to another behavior, uh, from one swarming behavior to another swarming behavior? Are there um, uh, uh, environmental conditions that quickly change that, or will it always change very slowly? Um, for fitting, <clears throat> the question is, how close does the simulation come to an actual measured data set? And for uh, computational or simulation steering, I'm actually not so sure how uh, parameter stability uh, plays a role here, but as I mentioned, I haven't really looked at this. Um, uncertainty is a big keyword, at least in the visualization domain. <coughs> There's lots of work there, but also in the simulation domain is how do we compute and propagate uncertainty of parameters or of uh, the actual model through the simulation. Um, and uh, again, this is cross-cutting through all the other tasks, really. Uh, and the question is, how reliable is the result of the simulation, really? And how the question, the challenge that uh, arises for us as civilization researchers, how can I effectively communicate that to the user? Um, but I'm actually already sort of in the challenges, and I'm almost done. Um, if you allow me, uh, just a couple more slides. Um, uh, the challenge is the way I see it, um, uh, that uh, this whole topic uh, is a problem of uh, sampling, rendering, uh, uh, as well as cognitive design and interface. Um, uh, 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 it's a cognitive problem, a design problem, and an interface problem. In terms of sampling, um, ideally, I'd like to put as many samples in this high dimensional space I can, I, as I can possibly put, could. But, um, of course, there's a time problem. Uh, the more samples I want to compute, the more simulations I want to run, the longer I have to wait. Um, but the fewer samples I have, the sooner I basically get my output, the less reliable is the whole uh, prediction that I'm actually doing and that, I, I, uh, that the, uh, the user is experiencing uh, in, uh, in the interaction. Uh, so we have the typical time accuracy trade-off uh, as a sampling problem. Um, so uh, the typical solution is, of course, uh, approximation uh, or, or regression depends on what community you're coming from. Um, you basically want to predict um, outputs of the simulation for parameter combinations that you actually didn't compute. Um, and uh, you fill in uh, the... the, um, the I'm running out of steam what I want to say here. <laughs> You're uh, filling in uh, the places where you don't know anything, actually. Uh, the rendering issue here um, that we had looked at a little bit more closely also is uh, producing all these plots based, say, on 100,000 uh, data points. How do you, can you do that in real time? Um, what is really important for us that the user can grab that um, uh, um, crosshair and move it around and in interactively explore the neighborhood, that's actually a rendering problem, which also has its limits. Ideally, you want to produce the same plot in 30 frames per second. Um, but what are the limits? How many data points can you use? Uh, how many input dimensions are possible? And what are the connections between those aspects? Um, it is a problem of cognition because um, uh, we are inherently three-dimensional people. Um, and I don't think we'll ever understand eight-dimensional uh, functions. Um, the question, though, is whether we really need to. Um, and uh, yet, how can we actually facilitate uh, an understanding yet of navigating an eight-dimensional space? And to what degree do we actually have to? That's a really interesting question to me, uh, where I frankly don't have a good answer. Um, but that's why it's on the challenges section. Um, User-centered design, I actually come more from a mathematical, graphical background, and so math is relatively easy for me. Not that math is easy. I didn't mean to say that. 
um, but I have an appreciation and an understanding of it. And I just, over the last sort of eight years, um, have uh, gone into the aspect of, well, how do I create tools that people can actually use? And I found that to be extremely hard and complicated. Uh, and there's a lot of literature out there is how do I achieve user-centered design? Um, uh, what kind of requirements uh, do I need to uh, pay attention to? Uh, how do I collect those requirements? Um, uh, and how does functionality, usability, and aesthetics uh, play a role to what degree? And how can I design tools that uh, keep all these aspects in, in mind and in the end will produce something that actual people will be happy to use? Uh, that is rather difficult. Um, along those lines, specifically, the uh, visual and interaction design um, is, uh, for high dimensional spaces is uh, daunting. How do I navigate multidimensional spaces effectively? Uh, should I use slices? Should I use scatter plots? Should I use multidimensional Pareto panels? Uh, how do they look like? Uh, how do I incorporate them in the exploration process? Um, I don't know. Uh, those are lots of interesting questions. And in summary, I would like to say that understanding parameter spaces uh, is, in my humble opinion, an essential uh, requirement for computational science in general. Uh, because the, the center uh, object of study here is, is the simulation models that computational scientists create. Um, understanding of multiple objectives is hard. Um, uh, and uh, I think there's a lot more work to be done. Um, and uh, one of the, the greatest um, sort of pats on the back for us was that uh, several of our uh, users of these different tools, they have said that um, they could reduce their work, uh, their amount of work that they put in into the problem actually from, from several days to just a few days. So in this particular example, uh, from uh, several days to a couple of hours, the Fluid Explorer, the animation people, they said from typically five working days and working on an animation, they can gut down their work to just four. Uh, and I think that's really awesome. <laughs> Last but not least, I didn't do all this work by myself, of course. I had a lot of really bright and fantastic people uh, that uh, helped me on this. Uh, some of whom you, uh, you might know. Steve Bertner, who actually graduated, is now in a financial company, Marion Brasherian, this is a startup. Stephen Ingram, he's doing a postdoc now at UBC. Tom, uh, who likes to go diving, uh, is uh, doing his PhD at the University of Vienna now. Uh, Stefan Bruckner is at the University of Bergen. Uh, Michael Siedlmeier also came to the University of Vienna. And Tamar Munzer, UBC Mellon at the University of Victoria. Last but not least, um, it's so much fun to have worked with these fantastic collaborators. Uh, especially Randall Peterman, uh, Andy Cooper, and Sean Cox at the Resource Environmental Management, Blair Tennessee at Spintro, the visual effects company, and Ahmed Saad, Britta Weber, and Christian Hege on Sean Mark Weberwitz in terms of the uh, image segmentation. And I'm at the end. Uh, if you have questions, I'd be delighted. Thank you for your attention thus far. Yeah, thank you, Thorsten, for this really interesting talk. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm sure Thorsten takes some questions. Have you got any questions? Yeah, I have a question. Um, <clears throat> how, do, how do you de decide how many combinations you are, are, are calculating? Um, or, or what parameters do you choose for the, the variation in parameters? I mean, uh, for example, the first uh, the segmentation problem, you said it's like 15 minutes for one second or something like that, so you cannot just calculate every possible combination, so yeah. how do you decide what to yeah. calculate? So I'd like to divide that into two questions. Uh, the first question is, what's the user interface? How do we ask the user, how do you want to sample the parameter space? And um, thus far, my best option is to, to just give them uh, to reformulate the question is, like, how long do you want to wait? Um, so if I have, say, or how long do, can you afford to wait? If they say a day, then I know I have 24 hours of compute time. And uh, uh, by knowing the simulation runs about 10 minutes, I know how many points I have. Uh, so I find that a little bit more uh, um, intuitive way of approaching that problem for a user. 
Uh, then they're asking, well, how many samples do you want? And you're like, well, I don't know, 10,000, 10,000, a million? Mm -hmm. uh, so, but the, the question that's connected with it, the other type of question is like, if you know you have a budget of 1,000 samples, where do you put them? So, uh, and that's difficult. Um, there is, there's of course a lot of literature. The standard approach in uh, statistic literature is to start with a uniform distribution of some kind, and then to do a prediction into a computer response surface, and then uh, do an adaptive refinement. And I think that's sort of, uh, that's how you should do it. Um, that makes a lot of sense to me, at least. Um, so part of your budget is a uniform distribution that you base things on, and the other budget of samples you spend on, on adapting. The question is, what percentage? I don't know. That's, that's another good question. Um, the other question is, what should be the uniform distribution? The standard approach might be a sort of a random uniform distribution. Um, the standard approach, at least in the statistical literature, is some sort of Latin hypercubes, if that means anything to you. Um, do you know the n rook problem? So you have a chessboard with rooks, and you want to distribute them such that uh, no rook can kill each other. So that's that's the poor man's version of a, of a or it's a two-dimensional version of a Latin hypercube. Um, personally, I find that question really interesting, and my proposed solution is some kind of a regular lattice, not a Cartesian one, but um, there's a lot of work to be done along those lines, and that, that work is in the early, early stages. But I find that problem really interesting, is how do you properly distribute samples in a multidimensional space and what consequences it has. And then the refinement uh, has a similar question as what kind of grid should the refinement happen based on what kind of information will you do the refinement, how do you compute the uncertainty or the, the, um, the, uh, the interval of certainty of the prediction. Uh, there's lots of statistical models along those lines. I think there's lots of work to be done there as well. Um, and uh, there, th that's an active research wing of the statistic literature. There's a domain that's called a design of experiments or design and analysis of computer experiments, days. Uh, there's a bunch of, of folks that are thinking along those lines, and I find that really exciting stuff. Yeah. question. You already mentioned why um, uh, motivated uh, why you use actually visualization instead of the full optimization to find uh, optimal parameters because you might have multiple computer objective functions so you have the user that you have to the fluid um, explorer example. But if you have objective functions, maybe multiple objective functions, could you use these objective functions for parameter prediction in a more efficient way instead of um, uniform distributed sampling or random sampling? At least partially for predicting um, more optimal function, more optimal, optimal parameter combinations that you still have to analyze using the visualization at the end. So that the question is, can you combine the optimization part of the game for visualization for sampling? Um, I, I guess. So the, the the big question for me is how. I mean, um, maybe there is. Um, and there's lots of different approaches. So I mean, like those two folks just had a best paper award uh, in sort of uh, trying to help the user uh, figure out, you know, what the weights should be. How do you actually combine and what impact the combination has on on a ranking of uh, 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 multiple approaches? And so the question would be. Uh, to me is if you can a priori constrain, I'm, I'm assuming what you're asking, is can you a priori constrain the space of possible parameter combination to just a small part, and you then still, through maybe those approaches or other approaches, um, explore uh, in a much more efficient way so that you take the interaction out of it because, uh, to be frank, ideally you don't want the interaction. The interaction takes time. But I, I'd argue the interaction that we have right now is much faster than what is used to be there. So, uh, but the next step should be getting rid of the interaction and just giving you three choices and say, this is essentially what the simulation does. A, B, or C, which one do you want? That would be better. I have no idea how. <laughs> uh, and I think that would be the sort of the next step. Um, but how do you take exactly the, the <coughs> competing objectives uh, and sort of constrain that. That would be really interesting.
interesting, but uh, I mean, it's not each objective function is going to do an optimization. The question is only how do you combine them? And maybe that is the part where you could be sure. Yeah, yeah, but the combination has a name. It's called a Pareto front. Um, so, uh, so let's let's make it really easy. You have you just you just have two uh, parameters, uh, alpha and beta, and say the objective function one is a plane of some kind, and uh, the objective function two is a plane of some kind, and uh, where they're optimal in both places is where they intersect, and that's known as the Pareto front. So ideally. You want to compute that really quickly. Mm -hmm. uh, however, computing that stuff is hard. Uh, there are some really interesting approaches in the machine learning literature uh, that do it through some kind of uh, like MCMC -MC approach. Uh, but uh, I'd like to. Uh, th th there's talks actually in uh, among topologists um, what can be done uh, in terms of uh, finding the the. How, how can you characterize the subspace that you're actually creating? So this 2D example, by the way, is, is really easy. But as soon as you go up in dimensions, it gets really hairy and hard to understand. So if you take this example, yep, with the two planes. Yep. One possibility is to sample on one plane in a uniform way and sample on the other plane in a uniform way, and then do a visualization to get you that line. Yep. What you also do is to look at the first objective function to send the only points that are in the neighborhood very close to the line, not exactly matching the line, do the same in the other direction. You might have a close approximation to your optimal solution. The, the problem is you don't know where the line is. Yeah. Um, so, if, I mean, like it's a chicken and the egg problem. If you know where the line is, yes, you can sample close to it. But if you have no idea where that thing is, where do you start? I mean, um, how do you? You have no idea what the shape of that objective function is. Actually, uh, that could be all over the place. It could be. It could be a plane. It could be a sine wave. It could be anything. Um, and so, the question is: If you don't know anything about the function, is how do you? How do you go about knowing it? And sort of the the standard approach is: some samples will be uniform to get an overall shape. And then you you refine in some ways, um, and um, if if there's a better method, better method, I'd like to know it, but I'm not aware of it. Let's put it that way. But I, I mean, that's a really interesting problem. I, I don't think it's really well solved at this point. Um, I think there's room for improvement for sure, and there's people that are working on it from different angles, uh, but. Um, uh, I mean, I'd like to have it solved so I can can incorporate the Pareto front in the visualizations, and basically uh, let the user just walk on that Pareto front and, and not worry about anything else because anything else is suboptimal. Why why worry about that? So, um, but I, I don't know exactly how. I, I I think I mean we're thinking in terms of well, if we had just have a cheap algorithm that finds us an approximate Pareto front, how do we actually create a visualization that helps people to just focus on those uh, Pareto optimal points? Um, that would be an improvement, for instance, to Tuner or to some other tools. Um, that would be the next steps. But um, I mean, and, and we're thinking along those lines. But well, we just got until here now, so. <laughs> but it's a yeah, it's a really good. I have a, a question connected to it. I mean, would it be possible if you if you if we go back to this eight-dimensional space and we have the hyper slices, hyper slices <laughs> and this is what you're showing to the user? And obviously, the user uh, is knowing what you're looking for, kinds of patterns. Would it uh, make sense to go to the image space and look for that and try to highlight possibly interesting or the most interesting ones? Isn't that what we didn't done in Fluid Explorer? I mean, there we, we didn't have the objective function, so there was nothing to show. Um, but what we did is we basically laid out the complete result space visually, and um, tried to be efficient about it. Um, but then visually have the the user sort of tell us what they're looking for and constrain it that way. Is is that what you mean, or am I a misunderstanding of what? Yeah, kind of, but you you're not doing a ranking in that case. I mean, um, you're just presenting the space, and the user then has to work with it. But there is no guidance that goes beyond showing the space. So the question is how the user can formulate what he's looking for. 
I don't know. That's really hard. Yes. Yeah, that's hard. I mean, so the, I mentioned it just quickly. There is a, there's a um, area also machine learning called active learning, and what they're doing is they're trying to learn that objective function. So if the objective function is not there, and the user cannot write it down and says it's x squared minus 3y plus 5 or something. Um, then what you want to do is, uh, and uh, some people at UBC did that actually with, with uh, fire animations. They showed them two fire animations says, which one is better according to your goal? And they say this one. And then they choose two other pairs and two other pairs and two other pairs. And so the more pairs that you show the user, the smarter and smarter the function gets. The, and you learn, basically, that optimization function. And then you can do, once you learn it, you can optimize it. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's one approach. It's very tedious, because in order to get, do something reliable, you have to look through lots of image pairs or, or, or lots of pairs of results. Uh, it's an interesting one. I think it would be worthwhile to think how can we how can we make that more efficient? Maybe there's uh, there's some cases for crowdsourcing. You know, maybe you can yeah. through Mechanical Turk you can learn some complicated functions. People are using this for sort of the uh, folding kind of stuff, uh, where you don't know what the exact folding is, but people will help the algorithm along. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's some interesting work along those lines, but I haven't seen that really in the visualization framework. It might be interesting to take on. Okay, so other questions? I have one last quick one. Yeah. Um, if you, you you talked about black boxes, algorithms are black boxes for the users who haven't developed it or not working in the field. And if you plug these boxes together, and you take the output of one box, which is the input, the parameters of the next box, uh, how would you uh, approach such kind of problem? So you create a workflow, and then you also have the problem that your uncertainty is yeah, propagating through this network, which makes it very complicated. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, are there solutions? To that um, so my, my first question would be, what's the specific application, and um, is, th is there any reason to look at the intermediate results? If there's no reason to look at the intermediate results, um, my first approach was just look at it as a one big black box, and you want to relate the inputs and the outputs. And the reason would be that the results not what you're expecting, or what is what is okay for you. And then you would need to go into the details of the pipeline. So it's a debugging kind of uh, approach? Yes, it's, the thinking is related to it. Mm -hmm. uh, I haven't thought very very hard about this. Um, and uh, so I don't think I have anything intelligent to say. I'm sorry. <laughs> but um, uh, it's an interesting problem. I mean, like, uh, I'd like to see the, the, the context of, of use and, and see what particular, in, in the specific case, what we can do. and then see what I can abstract from it. One thing that I didn't mention here is actually, um, so in the, in the old good computing science approach, uh, in 2007 when we started with this, there were a bunch of different problems that looked kind of like these. And we said, well, let's create one tool that solves them all. <laughs> uh, and we failed miserably. Um, and uh, then what we said, OK, it's, screw that. Um, let's create one tool for fisheries. Let's create one tool for animation people. Let's create one tool for this. And that was very successful. It also took us a lot of uh, sweat. Um, but now is the time, and what we're trying to do now is go back, is like figuring out what, what is actually common to all of these and what is different to all of these. And um, for common problems, can we create actual more abstract tools, more general tools that would solve these sub-problems? Um, and that's why I also came back to this abstraction. And I was trying to figure out what, I was wondering, why did we fail so badly uh, back then? OK, thank you. Thank you all for coming. And thanks again for thank giving you. this great talk. <laughs> so the next talk will be in December, just the second week in December. If you're interested, I am uh, going to talk from this new research, ETM theory on Visual effects in theme parks, which is theme parks in the vector. It would be quite different from the visualization. So, mm -hmm. so he's going to present us a graph that they have. Graph data that they have.